Welcome to church this morning. I'm Pastor Corey Conran. And you know, if you're visiting us for the first time here, thank you for coming today. It's great to gather to worship with you. And if you've joined us many times before, thank you for coming as well. It is so great to worship with you as well. I want you to know that you're loved and we are so thankful to be in this virtual space with you today. I know there are so many things going on in our world today and you have so many things that you're dealing with and trying to manage. And I get that sometimes it can seem overwhelming, but for this time today, I wanna to invite you to enter into a place of peace. So take a deep breath and know that right now you are in the very presence of God, right where you're at. Take a moment today and fill out the connection card that's found on our website at coopersvilleumc.org. It's, it'll really help us to know a little bit about who you are and how we can serve you and how we can pray for you today. And take a moment to comment below and greet one another this morning. Also, go ahead and like and share this video on your social media so that we can share this time of worship with more people who may need it today. Now, as we start our time of worship, would you join me in prayer? Oh, Lord, our God, we gather together today to give you thanks and praise your greatness. We praise your mighty works to the whole world. We praise you for your wonderful deeds. Your power is limitless. Your wisdom is unparalleled. Your grace is overwhelming and your love is never failing. You promise us, Lord, that you will never leave us nor forsake us. Let us worship you today in spirit and truth. And may we be blessed by being in your holy presence today. It's through your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, that we pray and all God's people said, amen. Noel, the angel did say, was to certain poor shepherds in fields as they lay, in fields where they lay keeping the sheep on a cold winter's night that was so deep. They looked up and saw a star shining in the east beyond them far and to the earth it gave great light and so Country afar to seek for us. 
Have you gotten used to writing 2022 yet? You know, it usually takes me a while to make that adjustment comfortably. At the beginning of the new year, you know, congregations of the Wesleyan Methodist traditions, we take this time to renew our covenant with God using what's called the Wesleyan Covenant Prayer. And it's a way of renewing our commitment with God and reminding ourselves what it means to be followers of Christ. This prayer describes the life of a follower of Christ on mission with Christ. It's a practical description of what Jesus was talking about when he said, if anyone wants to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. Now the covenant prayer helps us to remember that what this Jesus way of life looks like and what loving God with all of our heart and soul and mind and loving our neighbors as ourself requires of us. So this is what people called Methodists will do as a means of encouraging one another and, and ourselves and of recommitting our lives to God this year. We will pray this covenant prayer each Sunday this month. So if you're serious in your commitment to God, and in growing in your relationship with him and your service to this church or to his church in this world, then would you please pray this prayer with me aloud now? I am no longer my own, but yours. Put me to what you will. Place me with whom you will. Put me to doing. Put me to suffering. Let me be put to work for you or set aside for you. Praised for you or criticized for you. Let me be full. Let me be empty. Let me have all things. Let me have nothing. I freely and fully surrender all things to your glory and service. And now, O wonderful and holy God, creator, redeemer, and sustainer, you are mine and I am yours. So be it. And the covenant which I have made on earth, let it also be made in heaven. Amen. I want to introduce you this morning to our first guest preacher for the month. Dave Boomgard serves as the campus pastor for All Shores Wesleyan Church right here in Coopersville. He's a dear friend, a gifted pastor, and a faithful man of God. I invite you to listen and to hear the word from God that he brings us today. Hey, good morning. It is uh, great to be with you. My name is Dave. I'm a pastor and I'm a friend of Corey's. And uh, I know she is out on a time of spiritual renewal. And I'm so excited for her and praying for her. But this will be a time of really true refreshment and renewal. I don't know anybody that deserves it more who wor or who works harder. So honored to just be able to share God's with you this morning. Well, Corey asked a few of us to, to come in and kind of share a word this time. And, and she said, would you share just an encouraging word uh, with our congregation and with the church for this year ahead? And, you know, I think we can all use an encouraging word, don't you? It has been a long couple of years. It has been trying. It has been tiring. It's been frustrating. Maybe you feel like you have been in a battle and a battle you just can't win and it just won't end. You know, sometimes we don't even know who the enemy is in these battles. Sometimes it's COVID and this weird virus that has taken family and friends and, and you know, robbed us of experiences and really altered our lives. 
You know, we, we've experienced things like friends and family who we thought were for us, who now seem to be against us and we can't seem to get along with. It has just been exhausting, if I'm honest. Sometimes I hear people ask the question, you know, where is God in the midst of this? How come all this stuff is go going on? Our politics are so divisive. Our culture is changing so fast and it doesn't even feel like the world that I grew up in anymore. You know, COVID, this virus keeps mutating and changing and it doesn't seem to be going away. Do you ever find yourself doubting in the midst of this? Do you ever find your faith shaking a little bit? It's okay to admit it. God already knows it. And today, I just want to share a story with you from the scriptures. But before we dive into the scriptures, I just want to simply pray. Why don't you go ahead and bow your heads. Lord, I thank you that you give us your word, that you give us hope through your word, and that we can trust you in the midst of these things. I pray that as we uh, just communicate from your word today, God, that you will speak to us, that you will change us, that you will bring hope. God, in anything that is from you, I pray that that sticks and brings hope. But anything that's just for me that are my words, I pray that those will fall away. God, we thank you. We love you. We trust you. And we just ask that you move today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, I'm going to read the story from uh, 2 Kings today. It's uh, 2 Kings chapter uh, 6, and it starts in verse 8. And you might be familiar with this if you've been around the church. I'm just going to read the story, then we're going to talk about it a little bit. It said, And the king of Aram was at war with Israel. After conferring with his officers, he said, I will set up my camp in such and such a place. The man of God sent word to the king of Israel, beware of passing that place because the Arameans are going down there. So the king of Israel checked on the place indicated by the man of God. And time and time again, Elisha warned the king so that he was on his guard in such places. This enraged the king of Aram. He summoned his officers and demanded of them, will you not tell me of this... <coughs> Which one of us is on the side of the king of Israel? None of us, my lord, the king said, one of his officers. But Elisha, the prophet who is in Israel, tells the king of Israel the very words you speak in your bedroom. Go and find out where he is, the king ordered, so I can send men and capture him. The report came back. He is in Datham. And he sent horses and chariots and a strong force there. They went by night and surrounded the city. When the servant of the man of God got up and went out early the next morning, an army with horses and chariots had surrounded the city. Oh, my Lord, what shall we do? The servant asked. Don't be afraid, the prophet answered. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed, O oh Lord, open his eyes so he may see. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes and he looked and saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elijah. As the enemy came down toward him, Elisha prayed to the Lord, strike these people with blindness. So he struck them with blindness as Elisha had asked. Elisha told them, this is not the road and this is not the city. Follow me and I will lead you to the man you're looking for. And he led them to Samaria. After they entered the city, Elisha said, Lord, open the eyes of these men so they can see. Then the Lord opened their eyes and they looked and they were inside Samaria. When the king of Israel saw them, he asked Elijah, Shall I kill them, my father? Shall I kill them? Do not kill them, he answered. Would you kill men you have captured with your own sword or bow? Set food and water before them so that they may eat and drink and then go back to their master. So he prepared a great feast for them. And after they had finished eating and drinking, he sent them away and they returned to their master. So the bands from Aram stopped raiding Israel's territory. I love the story. I love how it starts where the king of Aram is just at war with Israel. He is, he is plotting against them. He is uh, setting up traps and he wants to go and uh, just kind of wipe out Israel. You know, and then we find out that Elisha has been warning the king of Israel what's going on. And the king of Aram is really, really frustrated with all this. What's amazing is Elisha didn't have blank cameras. He didn't have fancy spy equipment, no satellites to use or special listening devices to hear what the king was saying and where he was planning his attacks. But he did have God and he trusted when God spoke to him. See, he had built this relationship of trust and faith through prayer. And he built it through listening. You see, God was telling him where the king was gonna reign. Such an important part of prayer is listening. Part of, part of any relationship, any good relationship 
doesn't involve just talking, but it involves listening as well. It's a great lesson from Elisha. It's a deep relationship with God through prayer. And he trusted him. He trusted enough to tell the king of Israel, hey, don't go there because the, the king is going to try to wipe you out. And the king of Israel trusted him. He checked it out. He trusted him. He learned what was going on. And then the king was really, really mad. He was frustrated and he wanted to take Elisha out. He said, go and find out where he is so I can send men and, and, and capture him. The report came that he's in Datham. So when the servant of the man got up that morning, he went out, they looked outside. There was an army of horses and chariots surrounding him. The king had found out where he was at, surrounded that area with a big army. It said he was going to take Elijah out. He was going to capture him, but he was likely going to take him out. And the servant of Elisha walks outside and sees all this. And he comes in, and I am sure he is freaked out. He says, oh, no, my Lord, what shall we do? Elisha's friend is scared. He's probably freaked out. Can you imagine waking up and seeing that you're surrounded by an army with horses and chariots? He had to be very aware of what was going on and knowing that the king was after them. And I'm sure he had figured out that this was going to end poorly for him and Elijah. What shall we do was his immediate response. What are we going to do? We're outnumbered. This situation is hopeless. And I figure, and he thought this was going to end poorly. How are we going to get out of this situation? Should we run? Should we hide? What should we do? It's hopeless. We're outnumbered and we are wanted. Now, I have never woken up and looked outside and been surrounded by an army who wanted to take me out. And, and I doubt that you probably have either. Now, I could be wrong. But I bet that you have had problems that have come out of nowhere in your life. You got a phone call from the doctor with test results that were not good news. You went into work expecting it to work, but we're told you were laid off or had even lost your job. The police show up at your door and let you know that maybe a loved one was an accident in their life and maybe yours has changed forever. We never know when life is going to change. We don't know when these hurdles are come, when these disasters are going to fall on us. Could be in an instant, but we do know that we have a father who already knows and he is with us in the midst of them, no matter what. You see, Elijah's answer was, don't be afraid. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Don't be afraid. You can almost hear the calm in his voice, but, but seriously, don't be afraid. How could he be calm here? How could he be confident? He's facing, certainly, imprisonment, maybe torture, and possibly even death. They are outnumbered. There is no hope in this situation. And what could he be possibly talking about? There was nobody with them. Those who are with us are greater than those who are with them. You know, they were on their own. It wasn't looking good. I don't know what the servant must have been thinking there. I'm sure he must have been thinking, man, this, this guy, Elisha, maybe he has lost his mind because there is nobody with us. I don't know what he is talking about. And then Elisha prayed. He said, open his eyes. Lord, so that he may see. Then he opened the servant's eyes and he looked and saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. I love this. Elijah prayed. When his friend turned to Elisha in panic, Elisha turned to God in calmness and confidence. You see, prayer was a natural response for Elisha and I'm sure prayer was foundational to his relationship. Nothing was too big or too small for Elisha to pray about. I love what Corey Ten Boom Plus says. She says, if anything is small enough to worry about, it's small enough to pray about. There's nothing too big or too small that we can't take to God. If we are thinking about it, we should be praying about it. Now, can you imagine what his servant was thinking? As his eyes were opened up, as he sees these uh, horses and chariots of fire all around them, I'm sure he was overwhelmed. I'm sure he was relieved. Can you imagine the confidence that he has in God? as he sees what's going on around him. Now, I know if it was me and I saw this, I would be sure that the Lord's army would be coming down and going to wipe these guys out and save us. Or maybe they're going to swoop us up and take us out of here. But that's not what happens. I love the story because it has so many twists. So the army, as the army came down toward him, because the army couldn't see the Lord's army, um, 
Elisha prayed to the Lord again. He said, strike this army with blindness. So he struck, so God struck them with blindness as Elijah had asked. Again, Elisha prayed in the midst of uncertainty, in the midst of chaos, he prays. I'd love to know more about these prayers and what they sounded like. Did Elisha pray and ask God what, what to pray for? Uh, either way, he had a plan and, and God seemed to approve and honor that plan. It's not what I expected in this story for sure. I expected Elisha to ask for protection or for the enemy to be wiped out. Maybe they would be taken away or they'd be hidden from them or swept up. I don't know. Or that this army would just be wiped out and they wouldn't have to deal with them anymore. But he prayed that they would be blindness. It was very unique. Now when the army came down and they're blinded, Elisha told them, this is not the road and this is not the city. Follow me and I'll take you to the man you're looking for even though he was the man they were looking for. And he led them to Samaria. And after they entered the city, Elisha said, Lord, open the eyes of these men so that they can see. The Lord opened their eyes and they looked and they were inside Samaria. I love in the story how two different sets of people had their eyes open for different reasons. Now, as someone who is a bit sarcastic and appreciates humor, I really appreciate what Elisha did here. In their blindness, I'm sure they're confused they're scared and they're probably expected to be taken prisoner or even be wiped out. But Elijah just says, this isn't the place you're looking for. Follow me and I'll take you there. So Elijah, the very man they're leading for, is leading them right into a trap. This is brilliant. And then when God opens their eyes, they're in Samaria, right? It's probably surrounded by the Israel army. And I'm sure that they are embarrassed that they're confused, that they're frightened. They probably believe that now they're going to be prisoners or they're going to be tortured or they may even be killed. And even if they don't, what are they going to tell their commander? They have failed in their mission. And now they were in dire consequences as well. Now when the king of Israel sees them, now these guys have been after the king of Israel for years and years trying to take him out. He says to Elijah, shall I kill them, my father? Shall I kill them? And Elisha says, another plot to us, says, no, don't kill them. Feed them, give them water, send them on their way. Now, instead of harming them, we get this final plot to us. Elijah has them fed, taken care of, and sent home. Imagine kind of with their tail between their legs and in a new fear of God and of Israel. Can you imagine the, the whispers that were going on, the stories that were being shared? How did that happen? How did... How did Elisha have us blinded? How did God do that? His God is so powerful and mighty. And the plan works now because they go back home and I'm sure they share those stories and they realize the power of the God of Israel. And they stop reading Israel and trying to take them out. You see, in the midst of chaos, Elisha prayed and he trusted God. He knew he was not alone and that God would fight this battle for him. He trusted him even when he could not see. And I love how creative God is. Instead of simply wiping them out, he spares them. Now, I believe if that he had to wipe that army out, that it would have just been years and years and years of warring to get even, to come back. But he demonstrates his power in a unique and powerful way in pieces in the land. I believe they now understood how powerful and mighty, and they feared the Lord. I'm sure this built the faith of Elijah. I'm sure it built the faith of his friend and really all the people of Israel as God moved and protected them in a new and powerful way. So as we head into this new year, a year that we are ready for things to change or we're for ready for them to be better, but they might not be. We can be reminded in this passage that God is with us and he is for us. Even when we don't see him working, he is working. And prayer is the best way to build our connection and confidence in the Lord. See, I believe Elisha's life was built on prayer. He had learned to trust God in all situations, no matter how big or how small, they built his faith. Corey Tenboom was another great saying about prayer. She said, is prayer your spare tire or is it your steering wheel? In other words, are we just crying out to God when we're in trouble? Or are we listening to God when we pray and we're letting him guide and direct our life in the midst of all of it? You see, when things look, things look dire, Elisha turned to God. His servant panicked and turned to Elisha. Elisha turned calmly to God in prayer. He trusted God no matter what 
the outcome was going to be. You see, in this world, we will have trouble. Jesus himself told us that. So we should expect it. But he also told us that we can have peace because he has overcome the world. No matter what the outcome in this world, even if it's not favorable for us now, he has a place in heaven for us. But he is with us in the midst of it. In the midst of trials, God promises to be with us, to be close to us. You know, things aren't always going to turn out the way that we want, the way we see them. But if we see God in prayer, I think that we can have peace in the middle of it all. You see, more than anything, God is with us. His presence, his power is with us. He lives in us through the Holy Spirit. And prayer reminds us of God's power. When things seem hopeless, they are never hopeless with God. This isn't just a cool story, but it's a reminder of how God is at work, even when we don't see it. You know, I often wonder when I get to heaven, will I get to, to know, will I get to see all the times that God moved and he fought for me that I didn't know it or see it or feel it? Will I get to see the places where he directed my life and made things come out? Man, I don't, I don't know if I'll care when I get to heaven, but I things that I wonder about. You see, prayer opens our spiritual eyes. I also believe when we are connected to God that, that we start seeing his hand at work more and more and more. Listen to this story from the Global Prayer Digest. He told about a medical missionary to Africa who was speaking at his home church in Michigan. He told about he, how he often had to travel by bicycle through the jungle to a nearby city for supplies. It was a two-day trip that required camping overnight at the halfway point. And when he got to the city, he would go to the bank, he would get money, he would buy supplies, and then he would make the trip back. On one of these trips, he, he found two men fighting and one had been badly injured, so the missionary treated his wounds and he witnessed to him about Jesus. He returned home without incident. And on his next trip to town, the man he had treated now came up to him and said that he knew the missionary was carrying money and supplies. See, his man and some of his friends had followed him into the jungle even after he cared for him planning to kill him and take his money and his drugs. But just as they were ready to move into his campsite, they saw that he was surrounded by 26 armed guards. Now, when the missionary heard this, he laughed and said that he was all alone at that jungle campsite. But the man insisted, he said, insisted, he said, nope, not only me, but all five of my friends saw and counted 26 armed guards. It's because of them, we were afraid and we left you alone. At this very point, as a missionary is sharing, uh, a man jumped to his feet and said, can you tell me the exact date that this took place? Now the missionary thought for a moment and he was able to give the exact date. The man in the church continued, you see when it's night in Africa, it's morning here. That very morning, I got up and I was preparing to go play golf. And I was, as I was putting my golf bag in my car, I felt the Lord leading me to pray for you. This urging was so strong that I called the men in this church to meet here and pray for you. Would all those men who met with me on that day please stand up? Altogether, 26 men were standing. What an amazing story. How cool it is that as they prayed, God moved. Right? God surrounded this man with his angels to protect him. God opened the eyes of these bad guys, just like he did um, the army, so that once they, they had blinded them, he opened their eyes and they saw what was going on. But these guys got the chance to see God's hand at work. What an amazing story. So every once in a while, God pulls back the curtain and we get a, a glimpse of what is going on. And I think those things have to build our faith. So we have to share those stories. I've heard other stories like this and I have to be reminded of them and be reminded that God is with us even when we don't see it, even when we don't feel it that he is with us and he is for us. That's what I want to remember in this next year, that he is with you, that he is for you. And I believe that if we devote ourselves to seek him, especially through prayer, that we'll have a peace that really passes all understanding. I believe God will begin to open our eyes and move. I believe that we've got to learn just to seek him and trust him in every situation in our lives and believe that he is working for us because he is. Let me pray for us. Father, I thank you for your word. God, we believe that your word is true. We know these stories are true and they're much more than stories, God. We thank you 
that you sent your son, Jesus. We thank you that we have the Holy Spirit in us. But God, build our faith, build our prayer life. Let us know and have confidence that you are working in the midst of chaos in the world around us, that we can be rock steady because of the hope that we have in you, the hope that we have in the home that we have in heaven, and the hope that we have that you are moving in our lives each and every day. We love you, trust you, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Gracious and loving God, in the morning when we rise and in the evening when we lie down, and in all moments of our day in between, we believe that you are with us and you love us. And for that, we thank you, O oh God, for your eternal presence and your gracious care that follows us throughout our lives. We thank you especially for your steadfast love, which always embraces us and walks with us. And we thank you for the encouragement that we receive today from your word. Grant us the strength of faith to hold on and to believe, even when the way seems unclear, and even when our circumstances seem confusing and overwhelming. Help us to seek you in good times and in the times of struggle, so that we may live out our lives with faith and care, with compassion and service, and with love. We pray today for those who are ill and grieving, for those who are frightened and discouraged, and for those who are just weary and tired. Touch each one of these with your healing power and boost them, Lord, with an infusion of hope today. Bless as well those who are giving care, those who are loving, and friends who are reaching out with help and encouragement and support, Lord. And be with us, so God, as we seek to be a community, to be a church, where all are welcome and loved, where the gifts of all are celebrated. For we know, oh God, that we're created to be in relationship with one another and that we need each other in all of our diversity and all the various parts so that we may be a whole and functioning body. May we be and more and more become that sacred body of Christ here at Coopersville United Methodist Church so that we may bring glory to your name and shine the light of Christ into all the dark places of this world. Father, hear us now as we pray the way that Jesus taught us so long ago through the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The dictionary defines the word resolution as a firm decision or to do or not to do something. Resolutions imply intention, a determination or an aspiration to do something. You know, we resolve to eat better because we believe that it's good for us. The same with joining a gym or hiring a personal trainer. Now, the history of making new yearly resolutions at the New Year's date dates back 4,000 years to the Babylonians. And then the Romans later believed that January was a doorway of time to consider the previous year and a time to make changes for the new year. The early church adopted the spiritual practice of reflection of the past mistakes and resolving to do better. John Wesley himself took this practice and began, began a covenant renewal service that was meant to offer the church a chance to renew their commitments to God for the next year, which is why we've been adding the Wesleyan covenant prayer to our services in January. Over this month, I'm going to be sharing five New Year's resolution suggestions for us as individuals and that we as the church will be focusing on throughout the year. Now, each of these are commitments we can make based on scripture that will draw us closer to God and will help us to grow more into the people that he calls us to be, the people who can change this world. So this week's resolution is this, to remain flexible and open to what God is doing. Okay, raise your hand if you tend to get stressed when plans change or when things don't go as you'd planned or hoped. I mean, heck, we're, we're, we should be used to this by now, right? A great deal of our plans for the past couple of years kind of went out the window. School going virtual, churches going virtual, and getting creative about how to do worship, 
shopping looking different, family vacations being canceled, working from home. I mean, it's been so much stress and many changed plans. But God is still good among the stress. Amen. As we said last week, God has been active through all of it. We've learned new things. We've found new ways of accomplishing goals. We've responded to difficulties with great creativity. And, you know, sometimes we've even discovered better ways of doing things that we never would have otherwise. Romans 8, 28 tells us that God works all things together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purposes. Those all things, that includes the stresses in life. So we have to learn to be flexible in this life. I mean, instead of looking at them as problems, what if we held on loosely to our plans and looked at the changes as, well, maybe as plot twists, you know, as opportunities for God to do something new. So our resolution this week as individuals and as the church is to remain flexible and open to what God is doing. For songs of loudest praise Teach me some melodious sonnet Sung by flaming tongues above Praise the mountain fixed upon it Mount of thy Friends, thanks for joining us today at Coopersville United Methodist Church. Uh, we are so grateful that we could worship together, even as we're separated by distance. You know, we would love to worship with you again. We worship every Sunday morning here online and in person at our church building at 10 a.m. If you can make it in person, you know, we would love to meet you. But if not, we'll be right here as well. And we can't wait to gather with you again. 
as we close today, I have just a few things to share with you. The, thank you to all of you who have faithfully given and supported our church with your financial giving over the years. You and your giving, they help us to continue doing the work of ministry, of offering hope to the hurting and help to those in need. I mean, it's because of every single one of us who partners together to fund this church that we can continue doing this great work. Our giving is one way that we work to fulfill our mission to live, love, and serve as God calls us to. Now, you can give your offering and your tithes to support the ministry of the church now or anytime. You can go onto our website at coopersvilleumc.org and click the Give button to be taken to our safe and secure giving portal. You can give one time, you can set up recurring giving, or you can give to special programs there. You can also mail a check to the church or drop it off anytime you're in the building. Thank you for giving and for supporting this church. Thank you for partnering with us and for trusting that God is not done working in us and through us, and he is ready to do a new thing. I also want to ask you to head to our website there and click the serve button at the top of the page. So the give button and the serve button. There are many ways that you can get involved in our church with our worship, our ministries, and our outreach into the community. So please don't wait. Get involved today. Now, as we close, I want to leave you with this New Year's benediction as a prayer of blessing as you leave. May the God who gave us the last year and the Savior who walked at our side each day and the Spirit who filled us with life abundant, may he grace this new year with peace and hope and joy. And all God's people said, Amen. Be blessed, everyone. Angels we have heard on high Sweetly singing o'er the plains And the mountains in reply Echoing their joyous strain
yourself and lend your aid with the sing our Savior.